Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Gary Santo, President of Tilt, Tilt Holdings. Gary, thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what Tilt is for those who haven't heard about it, uh, how you got into the game, all that good stuff. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, like most, I'm a relative newcomer, although I guess being in since 2019 puts me somewhere in the middle uh, these days. But I mean, my background really uh, probably about 25 years in finance, working at companies in a lot of different sectors, but they all had one very similar characteristic. They were either a startup going public or they were going through some kind of a complete transformation, reinventing themselves, in some cases, relisting themselves. So, you know, when I came, when I looked at the cannabis sector a few years ago, back in 2019, when I first got in, it seemed like there was a chance there to sort of come back and be that gray hair version of my younger self <laughs> to try to show those folks who are trying to make an industry out of a hobby and a passion, uh, you know, how do we build a real company? Because I think that was the one thing that's been missing from uh, a number of the shops out there is it's one thing to raise money. It's one thing to have a dream, but now to build it to last and to turn it into something that will, you know, continue on and set the benchmark for the next round of people to come in the next wave of cannabis enthusiasts. I think that's that's where I felt the industry needed a little bit of help. So I did join a company at the time, Columbia Care, a uh, multi-state operator, helped them go public in April of 2019. Uh, and then Tilt came along around July of last year. And you know they're one of those companies that have had that epiphany. Uh, they raised a lot of capital. They spent a lot of capital. Uh, the pieces didn't always fit together, but they were in the process of a turnaround. And the story looked really exciting to me and the bones are really strong. So uh, here I am. That's awesome. There's been a lot of um, interest in cannabis. It's been incredibly speculative on, on the uh, Canadian stocks, for example. Uh, a lot of interest in, in private as well in the U.S. But with your IPO in Columbia Care, what was the advantage? You get first mover advantages getting cash, being in Canada, automatically federally legal. In the U.S., though, you have operations, Pennsylvania and Ohio, Massachusetts. We'll get into those. Um, but essentially going public, you have first mover advantages and in, in getting that capital. Can you tell us how that process of going IPO works and, and what kind of advantages that led to? And in the cannabis space, it's not your typical IPO. And sometimes I wonder if that's why some of the companies have struggled because there is something to be said for the IPO process. All the things that you have to do to get ready to go to market, getting out in the uh, you know, into the street and actually talking about the stock, hearing what the investor feedback is, seeing where the real interest lies. I think those are all very important pieces to building a company and knowing what the world's going to look like post IPO. In the cannabis sector, just by happenstance and certainly going through the Canadian system, you have a lot of these reverse takeovers or SPAC transactions where the money's already there. And literally you go to sleep one night as a private company, you wake up the next day as a public company. And it's more, it's almost like a debt financing, honestly, where you have a lot more model driven uh, valuation that goes on. As I said, the money's already been raised. It's a question of, has there been sufficient diligence in the underwriting? Now, I was very lucky with Columbia Care. Uh, they were incredibly pragmatic, former Goldman bankers. That company was ready to go public. I think it would have withstood an IPO, uh, unlike some of the other ones out there. Um, but it's, it's an interesting process because you don't have that day after euphoria where there's you know, you've, you've raised this capital and there's an opportunity for people to maybe have a little bit of wealth creation. A lot of those pieces are missing. It just feels like another day and now we have money that we can go and deploy. So the good news is it's there. You've known it's there. There's no question as to what price you're getting it at, but do you have a plan for what to do with that money? And are you going about the business of understanding what it means to be publicly traded now? So, you know, having that board construct, having to do the earnings releases, how you handle, you know, regulatory disclosure, things like that. And I think those are the pieces that by not doing a traditional IPO, you've had a lot of companies learning on the fly with a live stock out in the market. And you're up in the Canadian exchanges. So there they just trade a little bit differently, right? So the CSE is more of a venture exchange. The NEO and the TSX are your senior exchanges. But if you touch the plant, you can't go on the TSX. There's a lot of twists and turns uh, that create a lot of good work for accountants and lawyers and folks like that. Um, but you know, I think the important part is if you know why you need the capital, and you've, you've done your homework putting together the business case for it, it can be incredibly efficient to go that route. It, it's just completely different looking from a traditional IPO. You've got a lot of experience in finance, so you can probably help with, with this theory of mine that there was a lot of altruism in the cannabis space. People didn't really know how to run a professional business. And so with that kind of 
transformation or pivot, we're seeing some distressed assets on the West Coast and emerging markets in the US on the East Coast. Where do you see the value? I know that you are moving to Pennsylvania. You're, you're, um, you've got operations in Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, Massachusetts. So you are East Coast and looking for those new entries. But where do you see the value in, we'll, we'll call them distressed assets. These are existing marketplaces that are failing um, and you know, looking for that kind of professionalism to help them thrive and, and live another day. Where do you see that value though? It's a great question because for an emerging market, this is an emerging market that everybody seems to have an opinion on and know about. It's not like the early days of cryptocurrency or even tech when you had to educate the world what it is you were trying to do. Cannabis has been around for such a long time and, and I think we're in a third wave. So the first wave to me were sort of uh, the true believers, right? Those are the ones who believed in the plant and they were looking to do something to try to get that accepted at a national level. And they succeeded over the years. Then came the wave of the finance folks. And what was interesting about this wave is these weren't true operators per se. There were some, but most of the folks here knew how to raise capital and what, he needed, what needed to be said, but they didn't necessarily know how to build an operating business. And then when you layer in the regulatory regime that says, if I'm going to be in three states, I basically have to run three separate businesses. I get no economies of scale. So it becomes the worst integration story ever told for a group that really didn't have a lot of operational chops. What was interesting is how much credit the market gave out of the gates. You know, and, and I've said before, it's like people always said, how can you lose money selling cannabis? And the short answer is very easily. Uh, you know, it, it's a different world when you're dealing in regulated uh, markets. So, you know, I think as it pertains to where the value is today, there was a time I would say probably middle of 2019 where there were some incredible fire sales going on. And that was the true implosions of the first ones. Look, Tilt was one of those. Uh, you know, they raised a lot of money. They spent a lot of money. Um, they were fortunate that they had some very good internal folks that were able to step into the void when the senior management team was let go by the board. Mm. Uh, and as a result, they were able to bootstrap. They were entrepreneurs who knew how to bootstrap the company. And as a result, we came through this moment basically funding our entire operation out of cash flow from operations, not borrowing or selling anything. So it's put us in a great place. So as we look at opportunities, for us, it's a question of where you see the market going. Right now, I think after the, the elections, there was another euphoric wave that came through and prices started to spike all over again. You know, licenses in New York or licenses in New Jersey, or what about legalization in Pennsylvania? And, you know, the hope is that investors now have started to turn to the fundamentals. And is this a company that is built on a solid foundation? Or is this one of these that continues to grow revenue, but still doesn't have a line of sight to profitability? Uh, clearly, investors got tired of that in the middle of 2019, right after Columbia Care went public. Uh, you know, the whole market kind of had that, that downturn. And now you're starting to see some separation. The ones who are building the operations are truly where I think the value lies, because there are a few out there who are trading at pretty high multiples, but there's so many more like Tilt that have a profitable story, that have a good trajectory, that to an investor, this is a great time to get in. You're getting a second bite on the apple with a fundamentally driven set of companies out there. So you have to do a little digging, but I think for investors, there's opportunity. For us on the M&A front, I think it's, it's really staying true to where we see the, the industry going. And for us, it's CPG. We think that brands will start to promulgate in a fully legalized market. People always talk about um, cultivation getting commoditized. The big growers will come in. And I think for mainstream grow, the high yielding plants, that's probably true. I think there'll always be a place for those more boutique style grows, the, the limited batch runs, if you will. Um, you don't need 500 acres to grow that, but you know the indoor grows that are out there could work. I also think retail gets commoditized. I think COVID has a lot of people buying things online, doing curbside pickup. So the need to spend a lot of time at a lot of these gorgeous dispensaries that have been built out over the years mm. is down a little bit, I think. And that's going to become potential overhead that people have to deal with. I like that space in the middle, own that specialty supply chain, have that specialty cultivation, the manufacturing, and then the premium products that come from that. But where I think we look at it a little differently than others is we're not about our own retail. So we're not the MSO play that says we're going to be a store in every corner, sales per square foot. We're trying to partner with brands. We don't want to buy them. Uh, we want to partner with the really strong brands coming out of California that have held a price point in a race to the bottom market and give them an opportunity to come east and really start to promulgate that brand architecture. And you know where we are right now, you're right, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio, I think if we could figure out a way to get into New York and New Jersey, that would be the primary nexus 
for the type of end user who would buy those sorts of products. So, you know, for us, it's looking for those opportunities to partner with brands. Are there any ancillary pieces we might want to take in house? I mean, a good portion of our revenue comes from non plant touching vaporization hardware. So there's packaging that goes with that. So there's a lot of interesting touch points you can go. For us, we want to be B2B. We want to support all the MSOs and the LPs and the brands. We're not looking to compete with them. So it's a bit of a different model for us and what we think is interesting versus you know, somebody who might want to pay a ton of money just to go get some extra space in you know, New York, New Jersey, wherever. Right. Yeah, we saw a lot of, of hype about uh, needing to be profitable. So one of the number one predictions in 2020 was that companies were going to be profitable. Um, I think I could pull up some of those uh, predictions here. Um, price and profit was, was the number one push. You guys have reached that. Obviously, it's important to have profitability right now. Um, but it seems that, that the whole legalization in the U.S. has kind of taken over um, that price and profit uh, push, that narrative, that, that importance. And so I'm wondering with um, what you've seen with products 2.0 rolling out throughout Canada and some of the FOMO that the U.S. is seeing being squeezed between Canada and potentially Mexico legalizing, where do you kind of see, you mentioned mergers and acquisitions and that consolidation capitulation. Um, you also talked about square footage and stuff. We just had Chris Jones from Cannabis Express who has an 80 square foot uh, teeny, teeny store because he thinks you know some of the, the same uh, ideas you do, which is some of these extravagant stores are maybe overpaid, maybe real estate is at its height. Maybe you got to look at what's going to happen if or when that, that uh, commercial real estate correction happens. But with state limits in the U.S., it, you don't have infused coffee because it doesn't make sense. It's too expensive to manufacture infused coffee and sell it in each state. When the U.S. does legalize, where do you see those opportunities for product growth? Where's going to be like that, that thing that you, you see? Is it going to be vape technology that you guys have with Jupiter or is it going to be infused coffee? Where's it going to be at? You know, I think, I think form factors are becoming more important. For the longest time, price and potency were always the way to go, right? So you could take a look in California, what's the top seller? Usually it had a price or a potency component to it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. What we've noticed as we've worked with brands to bring them east, um, you know, we're trying to partner with them, not just be a contract manufacturer, because what they're finding out is their brand architecture doesn't necessarily play across the entire country. You have a different type of cannabis end user in California. In some instances, potentially more of a connoisseur that might understand and be willing to pay for certain things that somebody on the East Coast, they're not there yet. So to just bring that brand over, assume it's going to hold the architecture and the price point because it has a name, the brands aren't strong enough for that yet. So I think we have to work on creating that baseline across the country uh, of you know, what is good product? How do, you, how do you define that? What is the right form factor? Certainly, we're seeing it even in the vaping world where people are starting to migrate a little bit from traditional vaping into other forms of concentrates like the live resins, the shatters, the waxes. Um, they're looking to do something that is getting almost closer in, in the experience to, say, doing flour than necessarily doing a solvent-based concentrate, uh, the purity of it. I think to a certain extent, COVID probably pushed that. You know, as, as vapes sort of took a dip coming out of the vape crisis right into the respiratory pandemic, the utility of the vape disappeared when you're not working in an office setting. I can now light up a pre-roll in my house and I can work my way through it. I could never do that at work. I would not just gonna stand outside and go and, and light up and take a few puffs. Right. So I think there's a desire to try to have that fidelity come in a little bit more the purity. And we're starting to see that in how people look at the various form factors, whether it's the edibles, whether it's the, the vapes themselves, looking at the flower, do you do, uh, you know, do you have a flower with a little bit of a, you know, keep late stand or things like that. Um, so I think that's, that's going to become the wave of the future, that having consistent products, having products that you know the quality is going to be the same in California as it is in New York. We've seen some brands attempt to make the jump, and frankly, there is a tremendous drop-off. Uh, your experience with them on the East Coast versus the West Coast is night and day. Right. So I think it's going to be important as these brands move across too, not just the form factors, but make sure that quality is staying every step of the way. Otherwise, it's going to be hard for you to really get going. I mean, one of the challenges for a lot of these MSOs on the East Coast, because it's all pretty much limited licenses, except for like a Florida, it's hard to build a brand. Uh, it costs millions of dollars. And when you have limited footprint to do that in, and you don't really want to buy your competitors' products, it's that much harder, mm -hmm. right? So uh, infused coffees, I'm hearing a lot about beverages. Um, beverages are a little tricky. They're, they're bulky, they're heavy. 
uh, how you go about doing stuff. Infused coffee is a little bit easier, obviously. You could do like a Keurig pot or something. Um, but I think a lot of popularity with vape though, the, the vape carts right now in Arizona are huge because it's more conservative, whereas pre-rolls in Washington state fly off the shelves. So even with vape gate places like Arizona, where they're more conservative are going to consume vape at a much higher rate. 2019, one of the top predictions was going to be accurate dosing. That's where a lot of the money flow was going into was, um, cannabis lounges, which still haven't been a thing, accurate dosing and multi-state operators. So we saw the rise and fall of med men and the lack of leadership and, and people who knew how to run a business. Uh, that's my opinion. And then we saw some accurate dosing that really hasn't, you know, been at the forefront yet. Where is Jupiter in terms of accurate dosing and how do you think the FDA's uh, is it the FDA? Whoever's in charge of banning menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars, mm. how's that going to trickle down with terpenes and flavored vapes? I think taking it in reverse order, I think what we're seeing from consumers to a certain extent is the flavoring they want is more natural, right? So when you start talking about these infusions and even the infusions where you know, maybe a flower strain can't leave California, but they're going to give you the taste of that flower strain, but the potency of a different strain, I think consumers are starting to look through the infusion a little bit more and they want to get to the basics. That's why the live resin is such a big hit. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's a much different process. You get a much purer draw on that. The fidelity and the taste is more you know, to the liking of somebody who might like a flower. So I think we're seeing a migration there and away from the bubblegum flavor, the mango flavors and stuff. There'll always be a market for that, but I don't think that's where the world's going. And I'm not sure vaping ever really meant to go there. I can't speak for nicotine and tobacco based, but Certainly cannabis was always being viewed as a medicine first. You were doing that for a certain reason. Um, so you, know, you weren't doing it because you liked the flavor of bubblegum. Um, so I think that's, hmm. that's sort of where I see that part going. As far as the dosing, it's really interesting when you start to break down the claims that get made. And that's where you almost wish there was that FDA component or someone who can come in. And we've got an ISO certification for our lab here in Phoenix to be able to put out medical branded products. But when you talk about something as dosing, how do you define the dose? Is it the length of the draw? How hard you draw? Is it how much liquid comes across the wick? There's so many different ways to claim you have dosing. Uh, and then there's the heat. How, high, how hot do you make it? Do you have variable temperature batteries? So we've got fingers in a lot of those different pies, uh, you know, where we have variable temp products. Uh, you know, we actually do have a dose metered product that is out there, it's a timed draw. So no matter how hard you try to draw, you can only get so much out. So we're, we're in those areas. I think there's a lot further uh, where we can go. And you know, our, our CEO and, and the founder of Jupiter, Mark Scatterday, who helped adapt the C-cell technology that was being used in tobacco for use in cannabis, I think he sees a wide open green field of looking at other ways that we can do inhalation. He's almost dropping the word vaping and focusing on inhalation. Because you know, when you're looking at the waxes, the shatters, when you look at those dab rigs, there's some interesting utility factors to those if it didn't look like such a science experiment when you go to use it. So, you know, I think we'll be looking and, and that gets you to more dose meter. The more you can make a less viscous type of a concentrate that you're working with, the more precise you can probably dose that out. So, you know, I think that's where we're spending a lot of our time with R&D, trying to come up with true dosing, not just, you know, the, the kind of, it sounds like dosing, but at the end of the day, it's really not. Yeah, well, price is, is big too, right? Price and convenience are the two biggest factors for anything cannabis included for decision making. And so when you're looking at, um, you know, in Canada or Arizona, wherever, uh, when there's a new product like concentrate, and it's brown and, and nasty, people don't want to spend 60 $80 a gram, they're going to go to their local, you know, dealer and get that on the uh, legacy market. So I'm curious with with your, um, is it um, Sante Veritas? up in BC, you guys have a grow up there. I'm curious, the average grow, I believe is around $6 a gram um, that they're wholesaling. Canada's kind of seem to have some protectionism from imports from Colombia, if or when that that ceases, and the US does go legal, and we're growing currently at $1.30 a gram. How how is Canada going to compete against that? Are they just going to pivot and say, okay, we're not going to grow in in the uh, the polar regions up here in the north anymore? Or how how are you going to pivot to stay relevant? It, it's funny. So Sente Veritas, we are actually not operational. So that was our vehicle for the reverse takeover. It's a grow. 
Um, honestly, uh, you know, I wasn't around when the decision was made, made to build that out, but it's on an island in the Powell River mm. and it's accessible only by boat. So who would have <laughs> thought that putting a grow facility that's only accessible by boat might not be efficient? Oh, wow. Uh, so, and, and ironically, uh, ironically, you know, as we've worked on the other parts of the business and we've watched the supply in Canada become what it is, I don't think Canada needs another grow facility. Strangely enough, you, you, there's a fair amount of, of supply there. What's I think the two issues that I see with Canada more than anything else is the form factors. The 2.0 has definitely been helpful. We're seeing obviously an uptick with the vapes uh, and our own experience there. But then also I think the constriction on marketing. So there it's legalized, but the way that the brands are marketed and the packaging that goes around it almost works counter. If you could get the US packaging with the Canadian regulation, you'd have a hell of a market going. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead you've got a very difficult, you know, marketing pr prospects up in, in Canada. So I don't know necessarily how, how the Canadian market really starts to compete along those lines. I think they're evolving over time. Um, you know, I think they're also looking to life outside the borders of Canada. I, I've seen a lot of those shops start to look at the EU, the more medicinal markets out there. So it's possible they look beyond their own borders, not necessarily to the South, but you know, across the ocean a little bit. Um, you have those shops that do have a toehold here in the U.S. Obviously, it's all TBD because with all the regs here in the U.S., it's really going to depend what the code is written at because you could still get full legalization at the national level. But if you're going to allow the states to control it, they can make it just as restrictive as it is today in terms of being able to cross state lines, how you can sell a product within a state and things like that. So, um, so I guess, yeah, Canada is a bit of a TBD for us. It's, we've got a sales staff up there. We definitely do vape product up there. Uh, I don't know that we'll do anything with that Sante Veritas. I think we're looking at strategic options. I thought, I thought about making it like a cannabis spa because maybe- I was just thinking about that. You know, the first two things that came into my head was uh, Mike Tyson and Jay-Z, like liquidate that and sell it to them for uh, <laughs> a, a resort. That's exactly a hot, what I thought. Resort. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, I'd take a boat up there and there's a hotel and a grow and a whatever and you get the whole experience and maybe a teepee or something. Sign me up. <laughs> I love it. So you got ISO uh, ISO certified GMP, which is great uh, to, to manufacture everything clean quality to get into places that are like difficult, like Germany, I'm assuming, um, for international exports. So tell me a little bit about how that's going to work for either flower and or vape technology to kind of get those products uh, globally. Yeah, so the ISO certification, we don't have the GMP piece of it yet at this point. I think that's something we're looking at across our facilities and the steps we need to take to go through that. We're trying to look at everything from a reduction perspective, whether it's here in Jupiter or across our plant touching assets. What do we think the regulatory regime is going to look like in a fully legalized world? And should we be moving more towards an FDA style structure? Are we worried that is GMP really that you know, important? How do we want to work that through? So still working on that piece of it. But on the ISO side, I think for us, it allows us to get that medical certification. And one of our devices, uh, one of Jupiter's proprietary C cell devices uh, is called the L9. And we've partnered with an entity, Cannabo, out in Israel, and they actually went and got the medical certification for that device in Israel. We now have a partnership with them in the EU to do the exact same thing in Europe. Uh, and then that device will have the medical certification, and we think that will play very nicely uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the European markets. So mm -hmm. I think as we look at all of our products, we really like that medical certification piece. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be key to growing outside the U.S. Obviously, you don't really need it as much here in the U.S., uh, but it's helpful. It, it's very helpful, and it's something we take very seriously. So probably with partnerships is one of the better ways to go. If you've got a distribution already or you've got a good platform in one of the other countries, we don't need to go and reinvent the wheel there. Uh, we're happy to bring the technology, bring the IP, and work collaboratively and get a much more efficient and quick launch within those, those new jurisdictions. Tell me a little bit about Standard Farms. You guys are in over 95% of dispensaries in Pennsylvania, yep. which is interesting. You guys ship 85 or 850,000 medical marijuana products to the market since 2018 and have over 40 SKUs. Mm -hmm. Not too shabby in that Pennsylvania. And growing. And, and then remember, that's just cultivation and manufacturing. We do not have retail. Uh, and that's intentional. So when you look at our business model and, and why I think we're a different version of an MSO, the Jupiter business model was always B2B. It was working in, I think we have about 700 partnerships with MSOs, LPs, and brands selling to them directly, either on a white label basis, on a customized basis, or if you want to take one of the stock products, you can have that too, or we'll work bespoke with you. 
The problem, I think, when you look at the Jupiter model is it's very, very steady. It's profitable, but the margins aren't as sexy as they are on the plant touching side, right? So our gross margins on the Jupiter side are probably mid 20s. And on the EBITDA side, it's probably low to mid teens. Very steady. It's been that way. It was that way a year ago. It'll be that way a year from now, probably. Plant touching, we looked at that and said, how do we replicate that model? But this time we actually own the supply chain. So for Jupiter, we don't own the manufacturing. We partner with a company, S'more, out of, Hong, out of China. Um, how, can we, how can we replicate that? Well, that's exactly what we're doing in Pennsylvania. We own the whole supply chain, the grow, the manufacturing, but we don't pay attention to the retail piece. Instead, we just sell into all the other retail stores. Mm -hmm. So we have a top three brand in Standard Farms, which I think is remarkable given the fact that we don't have our own retail store to pump it through. It speaks to the quality. And we think that sets us up nicely for that brand strategy I talked about. So if you're a brand that wants to come east and you don't want to either sell yourself to an MSO or be captive to just their footprint, you can come and partner with us. And in the state of Pennsylvania, we'll get you in 95% of the retail stores on day one. Similarly, in Massachusetts, we sell into about 50% right now. We sell through everything we have. Um, so we sell to about 50%. We do have our own retail that's slowly coming online. We have one retail store. Uh, that's medicinal right now in Taunton. We're waiting for licenses on two other stores as well as adult use licenses for all of our stores. But that model of, of being that B2B provider and selling that wholesale, but selling high quality product that can help these shops fill their shelves, I think is going to be key for us. Because you know, I've heard some MSO uh, CEOs talk about you know, doing the Starbucks type of a thing where we're going to sell about 70% of what we sell will be our own. And then we'll have a curated group of brands that sort of round out the set so that the customer never leaves. Well, we want to be the provider of those curated brands, uh, you know, not necessarily the Standard Farms brand or our brand, but the other brands that we partner with, like a Her Highness or one of those other types of brands there. So that's, that's our angle, whether it's Ohio, where we do manufacturing, whether it's Pennsylvania, where we do manufacturing and cultivation, or Massachusetts, where we're fully vertical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it very interesting how certain products are only available at certain stores. I understand exclusivity with big box. That makes sense. I've been doing 20 stores on 420 for the last five years. It gives me an idea of trends that happens like 420 sales tend to be the everyday low sales price two years later at a discount store. Uh, you also see local brands that you wouldn't see um, in the city of Seattle. They're like 20 minutes away, you know, in a, in a blue collar area or some suburb. So interesting to see that you're going to be carrying other products because like you mentioned, you don't want them to leave. Um, whereas I was kind of in my little rut here in Seattle, not being able to get out, and then you don't see a lot of other products. So by offering those products, that's going to give those customers opportunities, opportunities to try new things. Uh, as we've seen Illinois come on board and $113 on average per purchase that's i'm assuming people tr wanting to try new things versus california's average at 65 dollars is the average delivery price so people are ordering probably more than they want because they want that convenience of delivery right so you kind of have to be able to maybe add all of those components in in order to kind of fulfill those customer demands post pandemic uh you know beyond curbside pickup how are you going to get those the products into their hands that they haven't had before yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think the selection is going to be key. So in Massachusetts, I could see us maybe selling more of our brand, our brand partners products and even our own. Um, but even the products that we and the brands we partner with, as we think about a Her Highness, or as you look at the other folks, I mean, the big names out there, right? You got your Raw Gardens, you got your Mammoth and the Heavy Hitters, you got your Old Pals. So as you look at all of those types of brands, we're very keen on looking at the architecture to make sure that our brands are complementary. So when we look at the portfolio we bring to all those stores we sell to, we want to make sure that we don't have brands that are fighting with each other, um, that, you know, you kind of set up that grid and say, all right, there's so many price points, so many quality points, and so many form factors. How do I do my best to make sure that I fill every one of those boxes, like, you know, like Super Bowl squares, as opposed to have everybody concentrated in one place? Because mm -hmm. whenever you talk to a brand, they always say the same thing. When we talk to any of the brands that want to come east, we want to be the number one brand uh, East. So, well, everybody wants to be the number one brand, or we want to be the top three brands. I get it. Everybody wants to be that too. It's going to be hard because of the way you sell in, on the East Coast. So we're very intentional with the brands we're selecting to work with. We're very intentional with how we distribute those out to all of our, you know, the retail stores that we partner with and we sell into to make sure that we do give as wide a variety as possible and, you know, a consistent variety as well, that you don't have all these stock outs and things like that. There'll always be room for the local guys to carry some of their own stuff. In fact, 
we offer white label services to some of those smaller shops that might want to take our base flour and just slap their name on it. We're happy to do that for them as well. So this way they can have an in-house cheap and cheerful brand or something like that. But really how we're looking at, you know, distributing, and it really is more of a distribution model for us than a retail model per se. It's, it's filling that, 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 that grid so that every time you go into any one of the stores that is a customer of ours, you'll get a pretty robust selection. What's your crystal ball prediction, uh, either for tilt or the cannabis industry at large? Where do you think it's going to be headed post-pandemic? There's been a lot of changes in the last year with the lockdown. Not really sure if it's going to go back to normal or even what that is. What is your crystal ball prediction uh, moving forward? I think consolidation is going to continue to occur. It was inevitable in this industry. Uh, whether or not prices become either more rational, you see a lot of deals getting done now with crazy tickets, but a lot more earnout based, right? So I think that's that's something that I think we'll continue to see more of. Like, how will these shops hold on to their business? So you know, I think that consolidation will continue. I think you'll start to see more ancillary businesses. I think start to pop up here and there. The big question to me is going to be the legalization aspect. More than I think, what is the new normal post COVID? I'm probably less concerned about that. I mean, we've seen a return to purchasing habits. Uh, you know, I think both by on the vaping side, coming through the vape crisis and the pandemic, we've seen a lot of shops return to their normal purchasing habits. Basket sizes, people aren't doing the pantry stocking anymore. Uh, so we think overall that's that's working its way through the pipe. It's really that legalization overhang. What happens there? What does it really look like? Can you have a true hub and spoke specialty retail type of a, you know, or a, a sector, which is really what this is at the end of the day, right? You have manufacturing, it's specialty retail. We just can't run our businesses that way right now. So the shops like a true leave who have built most of their business in one state, single state operators have a tremendous advantage in that state. Their margins look great because they can, they can feed so many stores from so few manufacturing and cultivation facilities. If I had those same number of stores spread out over 20 states, I have to have 20 facilities. So my margins are going to look worse, right? So I think that's the question. It's more what happens in a legalized world, how fast does that occur? And, you know, obviously access to banking, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we've got to start to migrate away from being this cash laden business right now. Absolutely. Yeah. The more act uh, safe banking, all that stuff is going to be huge if for when that happens. Um, looking yeah. forward to that. Absolutely. Uh, we covered a lot. Is there anything that we missed that you want to add any, uh, any plugs, any links uh, to add in the description? We'll add those in the show notes. Sure. I mean, uh, we have a pretty active uh, website, investor website at tiltholdings.com. Uh, there you can find out different things we have coming online. Um, I think you'll see a more intentional social media presence from us at the corporate level. We just added a new head of marketing who's really helping us work through because we're not promoting our own brands as much. It's a different kind of marketing, mm -hmm. um, but I think you'll start to see more about tilt. Uh, I think you'll see us leaning a lot more into a lot of interesting social equity causes. Uh, you know, we hired a new head of HR who that's one of his mandates. I wouldn't say he's a zealot, but he's heavily plugged in and we are very heavily committed to doing more than just writing checks uh, in the, in the, places that we serve. So I think for us, the big stories will be look for us to resolve our Massachusetts licenses soon. Uh, I think look for us to, you know, continue to roll out some new brand relationships that will help move things along. And, and really, I think our 2021 is in great shape. I'm already starting to look towards 2022 and beyond. Mm -hmm. So I think there'll be some interesting things we might be doing down the road a bit to really start to expand the company a bit more. Well, looking forward to hearing about the progress. But with that, I think we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Gary Santo, president of Tilt. Thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. My pleasure. Anytime. Happy to come back. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. And check out these other videos that we've got.